Yep, thank, thank you very much. Um, I did train many, many, many years just so I could get up at 2 o'clock in the morning and do surgery on a horse. And I am the client that you absolutely hate. When I watch how incredible this stuff is, I'm the guy that comes in and it's like, can't you just do this, X, Y, and Z? And I know that you're all very pleasant and you say yes. And what's going through your mind is, dude, that is going to take six months. You have no idea. So... Anyway, how high is higher education? We have a reason for this title, and I'm going to shortly get to it, all right? So uh, Dr. Moore, I'm going to either call him Dr. Moore or Jim or something else interchangeably through here. I kind of forget what to call him from time to time, and it goes back and forth. Um, he emailed me in November and said, um, we've been invited to give a talk uh, by some folks at AMI. What do you think? And... I emailed him back, and anytime Dr. Moore has an idea of something to do, you say yes, because it's going to turn out great. And I said, yeah, sure, let me look into it. And I got done sending that email. I have absolutely no idea what AMI is. So I Googled AMI, because I just agreed to give a talk, and I, it could be anything. And this is what is coming up when you Google AMI. And I thought, I still don't entirely know what this is. So I clicked on one of these links. Yes. And I thought, this is going to be incredible. I'm definitely, I'm definitely going to do this talk. There, there, surely this is not it, um, unless there was going to be something, in, a breakthrough in equine medicine that the inquirer was going to be interested in. So uh, I typed in um, higher ed. This, maybe a different AMI would come up. And in fact, something else did come up. <laughs> um, so you can see a big reason why we went with the title, How High is Higher Education. My father's a sculptor. That's, that's, that's his job. He, he gets paid to do that. So we were in the art field throughout our lives. So I know a tiny bit about art, but I'm pretty sure the Mona Lisa wasn't smoking a blunt, you know, in the original version of it. Anyway, so I emailed more back, and I said, I think there's something going on. And of course, there was. He said, you're an idiot. It's the wrong AMI. <laughs> so that's what ultimately uh, got us a title and got us here. So uh, a little just breakdown simply what we're going to talk about is we're going to go a little bit about how we were taught. We're going to talk about what the new challenges with teaching students are today in professional and medical um, curriculum. And our thoughts are of potential approaches to do a better job of it. So how we were taught, kind of exactly what I'm doing right now. Somebody gets up to the front and they just start talking and you sit there and you take notes. And um, we might look the same height, but we're not the same age. Um, there's 30 years between us, and yet the approach was the same for when Dr. Moore learned from when I learned. Um, when I was just finishing up vet school, probably the middle of it is when you at least started to get PowerPoint slides. But for the most part, it was just somebody coming up and talking, and you would hopefully write things down. You take notes. Sometimes they would be organized. I never had a single note that looked like that in the middle, organized with perfect lines. It was a mess. And usually, two-thirds of the way through the sentence, it just kind of tailed off as a line because I was falling asleep as I was writing it. You would go home and be like, okay, it's test time. You take out your notes, your book. You would highlight whatever you thought was important, or you would underline or maybe you even underline what you highlighted which is so redundant and it's unnecessary um, and you would hope that when you went back and you reread through them that you could just focus in but what I would do is I would highlight things and forget what its importance was so I'd have to reread it anyway and I would just go through this process highlight reread and really the whole goal it shouldn't have been but was and still is for many students just so I can memorize this information Taking examination, right? I get these facts that I've memorized. I put them down on an exam. I would walk out of the class. I would spend probably all night doing this. I should have been taking more time. Then all night doing this, I'd walk out of the examination, and I would flush it down. It would be great if it was still there a few months later, but I just pounded these facts in, and that was it, right? And, and eventually, I, with enough schooling and enough training, I could use this information that made it long-term, but anything that I didn't use all the time was gone, right? Short-term memory failed me for sure. So 
so from that, um, I'm just going to kind of pass it over to Jim here, and he's going to talk a little bit about our career plans going into it and our training on how we got to be relevant teachers or not. So um, as Jared said, we did it many years apart. Same approach, and we ended up with the same goals to be um, surgeons, veterinarians, first to get into vet school, then to train as surgeons, and then teach in a, um, in a vet school. So undergrad education for both of us, I did it at University of California at Davis, Jared did it here, was essentially the same thing. Uh, I mean, it was chemistry, it was chemistry lab, it was some sort of math and physics. And all of the science courses would just eat you up with that um, same approach that he just went through to memorize to take the test. But because we wanted to eventually become educators, we were able to take some electives that fit in with that. So College of Education would have uh, education-based courses. So even though we were heavy into the sciences, we had that chance to pick up some uh, other information that helped us. We both got into vet school. Um, I sat in the back row. Jared sat in the middle of the class. But it was the same uh, experience, the talking head at the front of the class, frantically taking notes. Then we did um, graduate work and surgery residency training. I did mine at Missouri. Uh, Jared did his at Ohio State. Same approach you're, you're working on. Um, for me, it was physiology, so I had a lot of physiology-based uh, courses and biochemistry and things like that. Jared did the same. But again, we were able to go to the College of Education and get some courses that taught us how students learn, um, how people think, and some ideas for addressing the curriculum. And then, eventually, we both ended up here on the surgery faculty for large animal department. So. Even when we started undergrad, we had opportunities to get us to the point where we are today, being educators in a veterinary school. How about a reality check on that? The only thing I've told you that was real is we got into vet school. We had no, ex no courses, no training to be teachers. All of these courses, that I just, we just made those up. So <laughs> what, what ends up happening to us and happens to 95% of people that teach, especially in the sciences, is that you end up in the front of the room and you're completely lost. You have no experience, no training to be a teacher. You don't know what to focus on other than your subject. You don't know what background knowledge they really have. And a lot of times, they've been doing the memorize, purge, memorize, purge, and that background knowledge isn't there. How do they really learn? You know, so, um, and both of us had the same experience. You've just completed your graduate education. You got more details in your head than you've ever had before. You're at the height of what you understand and that's what you want to deliver. So you get in a classroom, and whatever the subject matter is, you know a ton about that, and you want to share every possible detail and fact with the students. And it's the same, it's the same thing. It's the exact same thing that we had, sitting there writing things down or taking notes on a computer so that we could memorize it. To fast forward a bit to where we are right now is, just as Jim was saying, the volume of information each year that develops is huge. It gets larger and larger and larger, and the accessibility that the students have to it is huge. You can go and you can do an AMI Google and get everything you could possibly want. They can do the same thing with any education thing. So you have a tremendous amount of facts for them. I deliver a tremendous amount of facts. They can look up a tremendous amount of facts, but that doesn't actually mean they can use any of it, which is a really, really dangerous place to be when you're teaching people to treat people, animals, etc. 
So one big issue that we have is, and it's weird that this is a problem, but the volume of information is sometimes just too big. The other thing that is a huge issue, and this is a tough one to get through, from the time that we were six, seven, whenever you started going to school and taking tests, your success was based on your exam grades and that alone. It's not how well can you use it, how well can you do something with it, how well do you know it next year or five years. It's how do you do on that exact test. So you have this, this unfortunate combination of a tremendous amount of details that you need to know and the only thing that really matters is can you regurgitate them on a test and that's viewed as successful. Okay. What that creates is a scenario if I give somebody a a lot of facts and I say it's important for you to give them back to me, they have a very difficult time determining which fact is more important than others. So now everything is equally weighted and that's a really bad spot to be because everything in, in medicine is not equally weighted. But if you're memorizing facts as if they are, you might remember this completely unnecessary esoteric number that means absolutely nothing except to one person at one second in one day and you might have another set of facts that's incredibly vital for you to use for the rest of your life and they don't know the difference between which one. They remember the things that may not matter and that's tough. Okay? And it comes back to, you know, exactly what Jim was saying is I teach like I was taught, I'm trying my best not to be. I test like I was tested and you end up standing in front of people doing the same thing. You end up giving tests doing the same thing that you know is not all right. So you create this memorize and regurgitate and repeat. And for people, the further along they get in their careers, in particular in, in higher education, veterinary and medical school, you can start to develop coping mechanisms because regurgitation of these facts are important. And one coping mechanism is to make sure that fact is in front of you. And you can be creative about it like you'll see on the inside of this water bottle. You could be incredible. I, I would honestly, if somebody was cheating like this, I would probably pass them because it's just incredible what they've done. <laughs> or I wouldn't pass this person, but I would be very impressed with their dedication towards one particular compound, and that is, is making sure it is there forever. <laughs> okay. But the point is, is you start to do ridiculous things to remember ridiculous things when all you need to do, if you just take a step back, is just say, I just need to be able to use this. I just need to learn it and use it. That's it. Okay, so we have, there, there's, a, there's a lot of different ways to approach how do you move forward and there's two things that we were going to emphasize in this talk, two approaches. One is rather as we go forward to teach facts per se, I'm not trying to say facts are unimportant, right? they clearly are, but really teaching study approaches and or emphasizing study approaches when you're teaching is going to be really important for the long term uh, memory and usage of these facts that we're giving. And then also, in, in more is forcing me to do this more, you know, because I just get caught in my own head. I'm just, oh, I'm just going to go cut that horse open. Um, is to actually look at research and teaching, educational research, and see if you can apply it. Rather than just somebody coming and telling you it's good to teach like X, Y, and Z, actually, how can you incorporate it? Okay, so teach based on some of these research findings. So we're going to talk about those two things. So teach proven study strategies. What does this mean? All right, so there's a lot of commonly used strategies and there's a lot of effective strategies and they infrequently line up, right? A lot of the things that you do that's good for you, that's good for me, how I learned might actually be a terrible way to learn, but it's the way I do it and it works for me. Look, I got a 90, I got into vet school, I got A's. That still doesn't mean that your method of doing it is the best way, okay? And the other thing comes down to, you know, what defines an effective strategy, right? What defines the term effective? It cannot be short-term memory which means it cannot be doing well on a test that day. Effective strategies are those in which you can use this material for years to come. All right? So what are some commonly used strategies? Highlighting and underlining. I would say if you walk through an audience, not here, but you know, when I'm teaching, if you have somebody out with a highlighter and you look at their notes, from time to time you will get a paper that there's actually less words highlighted than there are highlighted. Right? The lack of a highlight becomes the important part. Okay? So highlighting and underlining. Now, I want to say we teach a course now, we're going to talk about it a little bit more at the end. It's an online course. It's got over 300 students in it now. And before this semester, we were just curious as we get more and more into this, how do people learn? And we asked them, we surveyed them before the course even started, what are 
the study strategies that you use so we can kind of see what our audience was going to be. Okay? So when we did that, about 60% of them say they learn by highlighting and underlining. The next one, rereading notes, rereading PowerPoint slides. Right? This is another thing that people will do. You get the notes, read them, you get the PowerPoint slides, you, you get to the point where you're so upset if you don't have your PowerPoint slides before the class, I have to have them, and then the night before you just go back through the slides, which might be great, assuming whatever was written on that PowerPoint slide is important. I might make a PowerPoint slide that I think is supposed to be a nice slide, visually appealing, that's got just a few words on it, and everything that was important that I said was not on the slide. But that, you're going through those slides the night before trying to learn, so you may miss a lot, etc. Okay, so when you reread your notes and your PowerPoint slides, about 83% of the people said that's how they learn. Right? And, and these are people who are going into med school, who are very successful, who are going to probably be great doctors. But they're doing a great job of studying with techniques that are proven to be ineffective for long term. And one proof of this, we were talking about this the other day, it's happened to both of us and it drives us crazy and I understand why it happens. Is you'll have a student that comes up to you in the middle of the test and they'll be like, I can see this fact. It's on slide nine of page three. I can see it right there. I, I know it. And you're like, what you're trying to do is just remember, not just memorize the information, you're memorizing the spatial arrangement of it on a slide I randomly made up, right? Like that's not learning per se, but it, I did it. That's, you know, my version of if I can remember that slide and I put it down, I'm going to do a great job on that test. Well, that might be your cardiologist in 20 years, right? That doesn't mean that they can use that information. It means they just remembered on where the slide it was. And that's a tough place to be, okay? So what are some effective strategies? Strategies that, are, that have been proven to help you have long-term uh, recollection and, and usage of these facts. Self-quizzing, super important, okay? And self-quizzing, to really be effective at it, what it means is you are pretending you're the teacher. What would I ask? And if you take the time to think, what would I ask if I were teaching this material, then you are automatically filtering out what's probably, hopefully, the important information. And you want to go through this by just self-quizzing yourself, just by thinking through it, but actually going through, and this has been shown, actually going through and writing your own test questions and then answering them does a remarkably good job of allowing you to use this material long term. We asked the students how many did it? 14%, right? Super effective, nobody's doing it. Another one is elaboration. Actually talking through something. I don't know if you guys can see it. It's snowing pretty hard outside. That is nuts. Okay, just an aside. <laughs> I'm, I'm clearly shiny object guy. <laughs> Am I even giving a talk? No. So, um, elaboration, talking through things, super, super helpful strategy, right? I thought that I knew material really well, right? Like, I went through two residencies. I got two doctorates. I must know a lot of stuff. And I get in front of students that don't know anything. It's my turn to teach them. And until you actually have to teach the material, you don't fully recognize how well you know it, right? That, being able to explain something to someone is mastery of the material. So being able to talk through it is super, super helpful. So elaborating what you can do, talking through it, is so necessary for the long-term memory. So you've got to create an environment which students can do this. You can't just say do it. You have to create a situation in which they can elaborate and learn that way. Surprisingly, this is way more than we thought. Two-thirds of our group, they're already doing it, which means students are getting together and they're studying together and they're talking through things, which is great. Okay, so the take-home message is what we need to do is promote self-quizzing, reinforce the impact of elaboration. Just get people thinking rather than just memorizing. And with that, Dr. Moore to the left. So the second thing we are trying to focus on is how to overcome the natural problems that occur when you're trying to learn something. So uh, memories decay about 50% in an hour proven to happen. The problem is our third year vet students, for instance, this is their home. We get 114 of them in here and lecture, and they sit here from 8 o'clock to 2 or 3, and they're sitting here 
with somebody talking, hopefully trying to interact with them, but a lot of that information is, is decaying. So the, the way you try to overcome that is to present fewer details, focus on the concepts, and try to encourage them to reflect on how they would use that, how they would tie that to something that they know. You gotta do something other than sitting there being stenographers. Drives me, sorry, it drives me crazy in this room because the students, they all have laptops and they sit there and they take every word that you're saying and periodically I'll just say, okay, everybody close your laptops, which they hate. Close the laptops and I'll just wait until they all do. And then I say, okay, we're 30 minutes into this lecture. Tell me something you didn't know 30 minutes ago. And I just wait them out until they start chirping some of the things, and I say, okay, so now you will remember those. You're gonna remember those things that you had to retrieve on your own, whereas if, if I asked you with your laptop open, you'd go there and start reading. It's not gonna do you any good. The real reason we don't like it is they're not laughing at our jokes, and clearly the only reason is because they're on their computer. It's got nothing to do with the jokes. Yeah. <laughs> None. So get, encourage them to reflect is important. The other thing that's important is old knowledge that's in your brain and new knowledge coming in compete. And so it, it's almost like if something comes in to stay, something's got to leave. So it, coming up with ways to connect new knowledge with the existing. So uh, I teach about equine GI diseases. A lot of the students have never been around a horse um, or have minimal interaction with horses. They can't envision these things. So I'll tie it in with something that a dog has, um, gastric dilatation, volvulus in a dog. I'll say the same sort of problem in the horse like that, to try to tie it to something that, that they have um, knowledge of already. And then always trying to put things in context and give them meaning. So I always wonder, you know, just how many interleukins do our students need to know about? But if, if you're, if somebody's teaching them about inflammation, they've all had wounds, they've all been, had inflamed tissue, and tie those, what's going on in that wound on you that you, know, you had two weeks ago to, to interleukin 47 that's coming from some cell. Um, trying to give things context and meaning is, is, is critical. We need to do a better job of integrating material ac across courses. So, in anatomy, when they're going through the um, arteries in the, in the chest and they're teaching about something with horses with guttural pouches, in uh, their other courses, they should be learning about the, the fungal elements that cause problems up in the uh, guttural pouch where the internal carotid is, and then the horse might have a bleeding episode. So in physiology, that should tie in with them learning about how to um, calculate stroke volume, cardiac output, those sorts of things. So we need to do a better job of not siloing what's going on in our education system because the students will do it on their own. We've got to come up with better ways of tying things together both horizontally and vertically in the curriculum. So some of the things that have been are being done to try to overcome the problems that we have with people sitting and uh, passively uh, during lectures is to use some active learning techniques. And one is the clickers. Everybody's had the clickers. So about 10 years ago, we started using clickers in one of the uh, elective courses that I teach. And I thought it was a good idea initially. And initially I thought it was a good idea because the quiet students could have a voice in what was going on. They could answer questions. And I've changed my mind over the last few years because veterinary medicine is a career where you've got to interact with people. You can't be in the background. It's it's one on one, you and somebody and their dog, you and somebody and their horse or their cow. You've got to be able to talk. So I've gone away from the clicker thing and try in the electives 
just trying to get students to talk and let them know that I don't care if they make mistakes. That's why I'm here, is to try to correct those and get them away from this hiding behind the, the clicker. I think it's a bad idea. Another thing that's done now a um, fair amount is what's called think, pair, share. So you give them a, a question up on the um, on a PowerPoint slide, and they're supposed to think about it, and then turn to their neighbor and talk about what they, you know, what their answer was. Think, pair, share. The problem is, if the, these two people here in the in the front both have the wrong answer, what the hell do they get out of sitting there and talking? It reinforces the problem that they've got. So a way to overcome that is a, pro, a program that's called Learning Catalytics. We're not using it yet in the vet school. We should be using it. And this is a, this is a brilliant idea. So um, students always sit in the same seats. So the third year students come in here in, in August and somebody sits there, that person can sit in that seat for the rest of the year. You're going to sit in that seat for the rest of the year. We all did it. So take advantage of that. And then using this program, at the beginning of the semester, you essentially say, I'm in row one, seat A. That's where I'm going to be. And during the semester, the, um, the instructor can put a question up, you know, multiple choice question up on, the, on a slide and say, OK, take a shot at answering it. And everybody takes a shot at answering it. And then you push a um, button on your iPad or, or laptop, and it creates groups. Here are three, and it creates groups where everybody's answered differently. And somebody might be right, or the, all three of them might have wrong answers, but you at least get people talking where they've got different opinions when they start. I think it's a brilliant. Uh, approach. A friend of mine uses it in a freshman chemistry class in Ohio State, and he said it's made the biggest difference because it gets three or four people. It says, get with the person behind you on your left, the person in the front on the right. He said it takes five minutes. They get together, um, they go through things, and they get done, and they have them re-vote, and then he'll go, huh. Well, we'll talk about that at the end of the hour. So they're thinking about that, whether or not they were right on that for the rest of that lecture. And he said it keeps them, in, keeps them involved, keeps them in it. Flip classrooms, another approach. Um, Michelle Barton and I have flipped an elective class about four years ago. We went from 16 lectures to four. We recorded um, a few um, conversations where the two of us are sitting down talking through some part of the um, information for the course, no lectures um, other than those four. And when the students come, come in, we work through cases. So they're working through cases. They're making mistakes, which they hate. But that's the way you learn. So we make them make mistakes. And initially, as you might expect, there was pushback. The first year we did this, um, we asked the students, so what do you think? And early in the class, they said, why don't you guys just teach? And we said, yeah, OK, we're not going to do that. So what else do you think? And six months later, when they're over in the other building in the clinic, so these are th third year students. They got out of third year, went into the clinic. Six months later, we surveyed them. And 85% of them said we wished we'd had more of those interactions because that helped us when we get into clinical rounds and things like that. Another approach is called scale up. And scale up stands for student-centered active learning environment with upside down pedagogies, which is why I call it scale up. <laughs> and in this, you put students in small groups, and they work through problems. So we've done this the last couple of years. We have a, a room next door where we do this. We've created these interactive case studies. We take first year vet students put them in uh, there in groups of six or seven. And we've created these cases to integrate material across anatomy, physical diagnosis, and physiology. And the aim, again, get them talking. 
get them talking, get them making mistakes and correcting each other. And so this last year we were standing there while they're doing all, working through this. And so 15 minutes into it, this is what's going on. 60 minutes. So they warmed up. They got over this, I don't want to say something. They started, some of them, arguing. But the best thing was seeing somebody get up from the table, go up and point at something on the screen and start trying to ask questions or explain things. It completely changed the way uh, I want to teach. And to show you that we're not the only ones doing this, the people at um, University of Washington a few years ago did a meta-analysis. They looked at 225 studies, undergraduate STEM courses, um, and they looked at the, the effect of lecture versus any sort of active learning. 29,000 students in the lecture courses, and the failure rate was 33%. That's a lot of students failing. They looked, at the, they looked at any study that had some type of active learning component to it, clicker sessions, getting them to work in groups. It dropped that failure rate by 12%. 3,500 students wouldn't have failed in, in those lecture-only only courses if there had been some type of active learning component to it. Something to get them talking, making mistakes. Something to make that information stick long term. Huge impact. And so the other things is, you know, incorporating active learning. Any type of active, active learning. It, what, they didn't focus just on one. Increase their performance on the examination. Lecturing alone increased the likelihood of failing 55%. The greatest quote I've seen on anything like this is, if conducted as a randomized controlled trial of medical interventions, lecturing would have been stopped. It would have, we would have stopped lecturing be, because it's bad. They proved that lecturing is absolutely the worst way to teach. If you do it on its own, you got to do it with something else. Some other things that we've been doing, we did a, um, we're involved in a project that's ongoing now. Um, NIDDK was interested in getting undergrads interested in laboratory research, so we did this study um, project on uh, glucose homeostasis. So this is obviously a snippet. So we gave rats pills. We had students create hypotheses, then they get data, then they had to interpret the hypotheses. So it didn't matter if they were right or wrong. It was getting them to put their necks out their, on the line with a hypothesis and then see if that hypothesis was right based on, on the data. So this is being tested now in a large um, undergrad um, course at Texas A&M, and we'll see how that work in comparison with the standard way that, that they were teaching. The other thing that we've done is we've made a lot of uh, Apple books, iBooks, I still call them iBooks for some reason, Apple books. We've made 48 of those. We give them away for free. We've had 84,000 downloads um, worldwide. Most of them are about veterinary medicine. Some of them we've made for fifth and sixth graders. We have a one that we made um, last year about the urinary system for fifth graders. It's called Urine Charge. So <laughs> you've got to have a little fun somewhere along the line. So that gets us to kind of the next thing that we're doing, the newest thing. And that is dabbling somewhere where we have no business dabbling, and it's into undergraduate education. And so from time to time, weekly, Dr. Moore and I get together at the, uh, there's a specialized off-site learning center here in Athens that we go and we talk about different educational things that we think are going to be effective. 
um, or a variety of other things. It's commonly called the taco stand. Um, and we'll go through different things. And from meeting there, we just started talking about these sorts of things, this, that meta-analysis. 12% not failing, right? 3,500 students that failed that wouldn't have failed. Like how, how can we do this differently? All we know is this lecture. How can we incorporate these other things? And we just started brainstorming, where's our impact? Majority of the students I teach are fourth year students when they're already in the hospital, right? It's not in a lecture. I teach a few lecture courses, but it's not gonna have big time impact. You know, where can we reach people a little bit more? We also started talking about our frustration with when you go and you grab a random first year student who's had literally four years of undergraduate education and they are elite to get into vet school. It's hard to get to vet school and you ask them a basic question, something like, what actually makes the lub-dub sound when the heart beats? How does that happen? Blank, right? Basic stuff they can't, it doesn't mean that they're not smart or they don't they wouldn't be able to recognize it, be like, oh yeah, that's it. But just explaining that out is difficult. And we got frustrated with the fact that you have all this undergraduate education, all these basic science requirements, you get to vet school and there's no incorporation of it into your clinical medicine, right? They just can't make the next step, despite the fact that they're taking anatomy and physiology. We said, is there any way we could reach them earlier? So we decided to do an online undergraduate course. And as a little bit of a playground, it had two purposes. One is a little bit of a playground to see can we test and try new things, right? And it's, an, it's a one credit hour course that we're, we're doing. That's one part. The other part is, is every dollar that we make from doing it, because it's undergraduate, we put back into hopefully making more stuff at the ERC. So we're also looking for a revenue source to, to drive making these really neat things, okay? So this is the course. We actually have two of them now. Um, we call it Foundations in Clinical Medicine. I'm going to go through a little bit so you can see what it is. Because this is, if you guys have been sitting here for the past 30 minutes being like, this is all great information. We were all students, but really, what does this have anything to do with why we're here today? We're going to finally get to it and show what you're doing, why it makes such a huge difference to students and teaching and putting this all together. So this course is, like I said, we have about 320 students in it. To put that in context, a vet school class has about 115 students per class, right? So our reach per semester is massive. And these might be students that go on to different things. About two-thirds of them female, one-third male. We originally said we want this for, really, when you're starting undergrad, you're freshman, sophomore, and we randomly picked a number. Like we, you know, when we're making an online course, we're like, I don't know what, we'll make it a 3,000 level, which when you're undergraduate and you don't teach undergraduates, means it's automatically an upper level class. So we kind of targeted the juniors and seniors, about you know 80% of them were either preparing for med or vet school or just applying. Okay, about 70% of the students are pre-med and then pre-physician's assistant, pre-vet, cut in half, divides up the rest. Okay, so the online course looks like this. Let's see if we can get out of it. Supposed to make it big. There we go. Great. So when you come into the module, so this is what the course, if a student came into the course, let me actually just go to course home. This is what it would look like. They come in, they say, okay, I'm going to take this course. This is, this is what I'm doing this semester. And then they click here to access the course content. You'll see we, on the left, we have different modules, module one, two, and three. And each module is built off of that clinical question that I might ask a student or this student or doctor might be sitting on an airplane and make the mistake of saying that they're a veterinarian to somebody that clearly has five poodles sitting next to them, right? And they're going to get asked questions all day long, right? So you need to be able to answer questions. So that somebody might ask or a family member might ask how, what makes the lub-dub sound? Or one of our modules is I'm supposed to fast because I got blood work and I ate a Cinnabon this morning. Is that going to make a big difference? Right? Being able to answer why it matters is important. So we built it around that, but the idea is to teach anatomy and physiology through a clinical context. A lot of this, why do I need to remember it type stuff? How do I need to know it? Okay, we divide our modules up into four parts. Okay, the first part is a clinical scenario. So this is going to be their first introduction to the material that we're giving them. And when you look at it, it's, it's about 
I don't know, 1,000 to 1,500 words of text that we put in here. We break it up, and we want, after everything that's about paragraph size, to have a visualization of the anatomy that they just read. Any other anatomy or physiology course, either someone's going to talk it to you, or you're just going to read it, and you don't have a 3D appreciation for it. So this is uh, what they'll get when they go on to it. You'll see the beating heart. And this is just the first one's introduction, the different cha chambers. And each paragraph builds onto that. Okay? It highlights it really well done. And this, this is as good of anatomy as you're going to get in person, except you get it with the physiology mixed in. Dr. Moore talked a lot about the soloing. You take anatomy class, and I teach you the structure of the heart. You take physiology, I teach you how the heart works. Rarely do you get to learn those two things together. When I took anatomy and physiology, they weren't even in the same semester, right? It wasn't even necessarily the same system. At least a lot of med schools now do systems training where they're getting in at the same time. But I might be trying to remember four months later, what is supposed to be happening in this cell, at this chamber? I can't get it all. I can't put it all together. So... As we work through, we'll have different things happening. Eventually, blood starts to go through the heart. As you can see, it goes through, and then you can see the different vessels it goes through. It's all building one onto the next, one onto the next. You can always see and interact with what you're reading and learning. I think this is the one that we want. So next, um, okay, blood's going through. You can see where it goes. You have the different valves. What we're going to do here is we're going to zoom in on the valves in a second. Okay, you can start to see, you know, what's a bicuspid versus a tricuspid? What actually makes the difference? You can see, you know, what keeps those, those valves from going the other direction? Chordae, tendinae, holding them in place. Where do they insert on? You can have anatomy and learn that, but when you put it all together at the same time and you have a means of, of remembering, a clinical context to remember it, that hopefully you take this in undergrad, you come to med school, that first year of med school, you're like, I know that stuff. That's great. I can actually focus in on the things that are really um, the next purpose of the course. Okay, blood moving through. And these are all things made out of ERC. I mean, they're incredible, right? So this is incorporation of everything that you guys do that makes doctors be able to treat you better. You know, I mean, that's the bottom line. You know, and hopefully this is just having this image and scrolling down is that 12%. Right? That's a major, major thing. Okay, so at the end, that's the clinical scenario. That's the first thing they'll get. We open this up to them. And they do it at their own pace. It's online. They can be sitting in their pajamas or whatever they'd want to wear, learning at whatever time they learn. Okay, and then after, you know, a week or so, we give them a, just a low stakes, one or two question quiz. Just something that you got to do to remember this. And then after that, we open up the exact same information, but seeing it a second way and in a different way. And these are videos that we completely rip off the internet, almost always from Khan Academy. Okay? But we handpick the ones that we think are going to coincide and correlate with what we're doing really well. So you know, we'll have the flow through the heart or two circulations. There might be little bits that add on it, but it's, I've already learned this material. I feel great about it. I'm going to see it another way. Okay? It reinforces it, and then we give them another quiz. Right? So they're building off reasons to do it. Then finally, a third part of it, of the course, and this is all sequentially offered, is we actually do the old school way at that point, excuse me, the traditional way, and we'll give them an assigned reading in a physiology book, which nobody likes, right? Like, no, maybe a few of you like it, but most people don't like to open up a physiology book and read. But if you've already seen the videos on it, you've done the interactions, you can visualize all this, this is not so bad because you feel like you know it well. We take out just very short excerpts that we think are the most important and really try to bang in the important points, okay? So they'll learn that, they take another quiz on it. So now they've had three ways of seeing something, and they've taken quizzes on it three times. Right? That information is in there, because this is what we think is fundamental information. Then finally, the last part of it, and this happens with each module, is we say, okay, you know the anatomy, you know how the heart works, you know the valves, what happens when things go wrong? This is actually clinical medicine. And what this really does is it finalizes why you need to know this information. And we call these points to ponder. We'll take three relevant aberrations, medical disease processes. Okay, so one would be are, are the auricles of the heart, right? Like you always think of the heart as an atrium and a ventricle. Two, two chambers on either side, four chambers. There's these things that are the auricles. Who cares about them? Do we have to care about them? Can you get disease from them? Well, you can. Right? So we talk about why those matter. And you're going to remember it when you see it. Next one, we all are 
intimately associated with and familiar with coronary artery disease, right? I'm having a heart attack. I got a, a, a clogged vessel somewhere. I need a stent. I got to go on Plavix. They tell me not to eat a cheeseburger. All that. Why does it matter? Well, you've already learned the anatomy. You know the blood flow. We hone in on what happens when one of those little areas gets a problem. So when you actually have it in med school, it's already in there. And then another one, a murmur. What happens when those valves don't fit together perfectly? What's the issue, right? These are basic things when you get to med school, but it's nuts how f much education you have to have before it's in your head. So that's a little bit about how we do the course. And then we'll have numerous other content and different topics. Another one that we'll have in here, I just because just it's neat, it's just, you know, the things that you guys make just blows my mind. Um, one point of time, this is one on breathing and, and the arytenoids, the, you know, the, the two parts right before your trachea that open and close like shutters so you can breathe. Oh, that's the question. Please hold. I swear I'm involved with this course. Here we go. Points to ponder. Module. Okay, so this is what happens when your vocal folds become paralyzed. And remember, might be pre-med students, might be pre-vet students. Can you relate them to each other? Give them a reason to remember. Okay, so there's a nerve that controls one of your retinoids. Right, your retinoids are the two shutters at the top of the trachea that open and close when you breathe in. There's a nerve, they have different nerves that control each one. Well, there's one nerve on the left-hand side called the recurrent laryngeal nerve. All right, if anybody doesn't know this or can't remember it. So these are your two retinoids that open up. Okay? And there's a muscle, there's a nerve that innervates the muscle. The muscle contracts, opens it up. Well, this nerve, the recurrent laryngeal nerve on the left side, it is crazy, the design of it. It goes all the way down, wraps around the base of the heart, and then comes all the way back up and inserts on the muscle. A huge pathway of a nerve. Right? And if you get an issue with that nerve, then that arytenoid's not going to function that well, which means you're not going to breathe that well. Okay? So you'd say, okay, I'm a human. That space isn't that far. I mean, these videos are just great. Okay, let's see what happens when it, I think this is. Okay, you can see the nerve conduction is coming in. They're innervating the muscle. Everything's opening up just fine. What happens when you get a unilateral paralysis? Okay, here's that left side. Nerve impulse isn't coming. Retinoid doesn't open up. So what it looks like over here is you just have half your airway doesn't open. Right? And you'll be able to breathe with that, but let's say you need to be an athlete. It might drastically affect your performance. Well, let's say you need to be an athlete and you happen to have a much longer neck. Okay? Six centimeter differences. Right? This is all translational. Same nerve. The horse, that nerve is going three feet. Right? That's a huge way that anywhere you could have an issue along that nerve conduction, you're going to decrease the ability. What if you're a giraffe? Right? It's massive. What if you were a brontosaurus? We, clearly, this is why all dinosaurs are gone, right? <laughs> so the impact is huge. And when you take the time and you go through this, you remember that, right? You might just, it might be a funny joke about a brontosaurus, but now you're starting to think of length. And if you think of length, you're like, oh, there was a nerve that did it. And what does that nerve do? It innervates on that muscle. What if that muscle doesn't work? Then you don't open up. Physiology, neurology, respiratory disease, like that hones in a ton for you, right? That moment is super helpful. And that's all you're trying to create with these little things. So that's a little bit about what we do in our course. Let's see if I can back my way out of here. I think I need to do this, and then this, and then this. OK, so the online education, self-reflection assignments. This is the last part that we do. Right? This is a new thing that we're doing now, is because uh, Jim read this in a book, that when Elaboration is helpful, but when students can take the time to pick out one point of what they just learned that they think is important, and they can put that in their own words, they remember it even better. So after they go through these four parts of the module, we ask them to make a 30-second informal video just stating one thing that was important to you, why it'll be important to you going forward. How do you think you'll remember it? Why do you think it matters? And we have them do this before they take the quiz at the end just as, as a means of practicing and learning and trying to incorporate the things that we say are important, the study techniques, okay? And how it's going to be applied in my healthcare. So this is just a few snippets of a few students that did it. Mm. Uh-oh, we knew this was going to happen.
Okay, so the take home for this, these sorts of things, you, you know, teaching based on learning in general and what we're trying to do in this course and what we, we need to be doing in many courses is reduce the details so they know what really is important. When you have that foundation, you can build the details back in, right? But you cannot give it to them all up front. Reiterate the key concepts over and over and over again so they get it. And you need to link any knowledge that you get to an experience, right? Give me a reason to remember this. Okay, and ultimately then you'll incorporate these active learning opportunities that you're dropping your failure rate down 10 or 15% just by doing something different. Okay? And the last part, of course, is just always encourage self-reflection. This is the self-testing, the elaboration, and what we call the thinking ahead and the looking ahead. Um, you know, there's a ton of people that make all these things. Right? I'm, I'm by far the least important one of them. I just walk around and randomly have a question, and really smart, talented people make it. So it may, when you're making these little videos, you might say, okay, yes, he, he wants the nerve conduction to look a little bit differently, and I might be crazy. Like, the impact it has, I want you to know, it's, it's massive, right? It's massive. This might be the person who this sets home with, right? That, that one, of that, one of those people in the Thinking Ahead video that now lo knows it better as an undergrad is going to be more prepared in med school, and they might be the person taking care of you in 20 years or your kid, right? It's not the person who just was trying to remember that fact at the bottom of a PowerPoint slide. And I think that's, that's influential, all right? So tons of people to help the staff at ERC, and then I'm sure, I wouldn't even know, but a lot of these graduate students might be here. You know, you've made a lot of great things. So with that, I think we have seven minutes and 56 seconds to answer any questions or allow you to go to the restroom before the next one or do both. Anyone has questions, raise your hand, I'll bring you the mic. One question, yep, I can repeat it too, I, I can hear you. Hey Brad. Hi, um, so I'm physical therapy students and first off, your talk was amazing. It really echoes a lot of the stuff that I'm seeing just in health professional education in general, but y'all did an incredible job of kind of breaking down what you've been doing to combat that. Um, but I guess my question is, Students that are really learning, taker. Traditional evaluations. So, what have you guys been doing, maybe, to combat how students learn if they aren't necessarily as naturally skilled at test taking? We talk about this a lot. Okay, um, what we're what we do in this in the online course, there, there's different ways to handle this, right? Because of the, we teach in different environments, right? So for the online course, what we do is low stakes questions in many of them, right? We don't make getting things wrong as punitive, constant reinforcement, but you can't get away from the fact that there is going to be testing in some form. What we have, what we're going to incorporate in here, but we haven't yet, uh, and I think this will be a helpful thing, is, is when you get a question right or wrong, something prompts up that says why it was right or wrong. So reinforcement of the answer, so you understand why you got something wrong when you got it wrong. What we would love to do, and we just don't know how to do it yet, is we watched this video that, uh, that Saul Khan did, um, and he talked about 80%, let's say a student gets an 80% on a test, and you're like, okay, great, they're gonna end up with a B. But what that means is 20% they don't know. If the goal is mastery, right, and not necessarily the grade, is there a way that and the test is just identify, rather than telling you what you do know, it's identifying what you need to know. So we've been, and we talk about this weekly, and they're not sure how to do it yet. Is there a way that we can build in, okay, you got an 80 here, you take it again, you take it again. But it, it can't just be simply, you get another chance at the test. You know, and we don't know how to do that yet. That's the undergrad course. For vet school, you know, the courses that I teach, um, they're not multiple choice. Um, like the course I'm teaching right now is, is uh, uh, large animal surgery, where we go through practical how to do a surgery, and then we actually have labs where you do the surgery. Uh, some cadavers, some live animal. So I can see how you're doing based on whether you can do it. So it's a different method off paper, but that's unique. Um, fourth year students, there's no written test anymore. So you can be a terrible test taker and I can still teach you or we can still assess how you're doing because it's asking you questions on the spot 
constantly. And that's really, really important. This is what I tell the students from the beginning is I really don't care if you get the answer right or wrong, right? Like when you get a wrong answer, we have now identified something that you don't know because this is where you have to get it. Next year when you get it wrong, it's going to be a huge issue, right? No one's going to be there to help you, right? So you continually ask questions, make them answer. And that's the other thing is make them answer. It's so easy for you to say something or you answer for them that they're like, yeah, that sounds right. Elaborating that answer is vital. You know, the whole see one, do one, teach one thing, like the reason it's like that is because the teach one is where you get it the best. You know, so, so the short answer is I have no idea how to test on paper for bad test takers. You know, I also, we also don't have to really experience it that much because by the time the students get to vet school, they are so funneled out that they're the good test takers. I think the bigger issue is, is how do you teach a good test taker, right? That's the problem. Some of these students, they are excelling in the classroom and know nothing. That's the bigger issue if you're trying to train somebody to do the job. If, if a lot of these bad test takers might be bad test takers just because their strategy for learning or our strategy for teaching is setting them up to be a bad test taker. You know, that might be the other issue. So that's the other thing that we can do is we still have to assess, but maybe they're, they're that 12% that's not going to fail because they've learned it differently. They see the question differently now. Anybody else? Thanks a lot. Appreciate it.